You're listening to the cycling podcast at the Vuelta España in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, I'm Lionel Burney and I'm with Daniel Freed. Hello, Lionel. Good evening. How's it going? Not too bad. It's been very warm today, hasn't it, here in Spain? Not your weather at all, is it? No, I'm turning pink. Very pink. Turning, (laughs) turning. The gerund. I don't think we need the gerund there. I think we need the past participle. Yeah, well, I would have fitted in on the beach at Peniscola because um, there were a lot of very pink people there. Some had had gone beyond pink to mahogany. Um, I don't know what what fate awaits me, but this is uh, is not not the sort of weather I like working in, certainly. No, it was about 35, 36 degrees, certainly when we set out this morning from Alcañiz, um, yeah, and I mean, it's a very hot part of Spain, isn't it? Long way inland. There was a bit of a breeze, though. And, um, it was we a hot breeze, some... though, wasn't it? It was like being in a hairdryer. It was, and we went through some... That reminds me, actually, the hairdryer. Did I tell you about overhearing the Cayo Rural team talk the other day? I think you did, no. yeah. I think you've, you've said this, sure. on the this on the podcast. No, if not. No. Tell it again, Possibly if you've already not. heard Possibly this. Not. Well, they missed a break two days in a row in their home region, and... Um, yeah, I, I found myself in a position, not deliberately, but I, I did find myself at the bottom of the Cairo Rao steps, the bus steps, on Saturday morning. And um, I forget the name of their direct sportive, their main direct sportive. He's, he's a Basque. And, um, yeah, I heard him really giving them the, the Alex Ferguson treatment, the hairdryer, um, <laughs> telling them in no uncertain terms that they had two days, really, the weekend to sort of restore some dignity and save their Vuelta. Was he not annoyed that they were all looking at their phones at some point as yeah, well? Yeah, there is was that? something to that effect. Yeah. yeah, well, it's the modern world now, isn't it? Everybody's looking at their phone, probably trying to download the cycling podcast, I'll be bound. Um, <laughs> anyway, let's talk about stage 16 of the Vuelta, 156 kilometres, probably the quietest stage of the race on a very hot day. Six riders made the early break. Davide Villela of Cannondale, Mario Costa of Lamprey, Sylvain Dillier of BMC, Sven Eric Bystrom of Katusha, Luis Angel Mate of Cofidis and Julian Maurice of Direct Energy. And their lead was never more than three and a half minutes, really. It never looked like it was going to work out. With 17 kilometres to go, Dillier attacked and was followed by Mate and Bystrom. The others were caught, and then with 12 kilometres to go, it was all back together. Um, with three kilometres left, Daniele Bernati of Tinkoff took a flyer. Really impressive late move. He's obviously a good sprinter, and we have seen him try these kind of almost Filippo Pozzato winning oh, Milan yeah, San glad, Remo. I'm glad, that, I'm glad that you didn't use any other reference point that you used Pozzato, for uh, whom these moves have never, ever resulted in success. Apart from Milan San place. Remo, 2006. Well, not really. He was away over the Poggio, wasn't he? True enough. OK. But uh, yeah, OK. All right. Anyway, Benatti took a flyer and he held off the bunch until inside 500 metres to go. A really strong effort from him. Um, but in the sprint, it was the Luxembourg rider Jean-Pierre Drucker of BMC. who was by far the strongest And this was the 10th stage of this race that was won by a first-time Grand Tour stage winner. It really has been the race of the breakthrough performance. Second and third were two German riders, Rudi Selig of Bora and Nikias Arndt of Giant Alpecin. Tomorrow is a rest day, and we'll be back on Wednesday uh, when the race resumes. But this morning, Daniel, I was in Alcanis, and I was having a chat, not on tape, with uh, quite a quite an agitated Sean Yates of, of the Tinkoff team. He's one of the sports directors there. And he was still smarting a little bit from the decision to allow the 91 riders who finished outside the time limit at Formigal to continue in the race. And I can't, won't sort of... Uh, I'll paraphrase what he said, but basically he thought that the riders weren't taking it seriously enough and that they had a duty to maintain a full and strong effort to get to the line as quickly as possible and not sit up. I was doing a bit of a calculation on the average speed. The stage was won by Gianluca Brambilla in, uh, with an average speed of around 40 kilometres an hour, just over, for, for uh, the 118 kilometres. And the Gruppetto averaged 31 kilometres an hour. That's, again, pretty dawdly pace. It's not like they tried to ride on and make their best effort to um, get over the line inside the time cut. And Yates was annoyed because he said, well, there'll be riders in that group who may well go on and shape the race. They might make it difficult on another day. And perhaps they shouldn't still be in the race. And, of course, 
As we saw at the finish, Daniele Benatti, who did make the time cut yesterday, was away. And Drucker and all the other riders in the top ten were should have been, could have been eliminated if they had applied the letter of the law. Now, we'll just hear from three people who offer differing opinions because this is one that divides people. So this morning I also spoke to Max Chiandri, sports director of BMC Racing. So let's hang hear on, what his on, verdict was. On. When did sports director become Derry Gurr in the cycling podcast? We're supposed to be the last bastion of proper cycling vernacular. We should be calling them director sportif, yeah, but we're in Spain. Well, no, but come on. Director Sportif. Oh, no, no. Because That's in the, it's in the style guide. It's not in the style guide because team, we, this is quite a deviation here, but Tinkoff and BMC both refer to their their uh, staff as sports directors. We don't call Sky Swanyers carers. No, we, we don't. don't. We, 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 them, but so but we're, we're, Director we're, Sportif, Cycling Podcast style guide says that Director Sportif is the Duriger. Th- this this is in danger of becoming almost as controversial as the whether or not the rider should have been allowed to continue in the race we're going to we're going to be inundated now if you're if you're team daniel and you think we should always refer to them as director sportif then then say so on twitter and if you think S sports on the director, director and on the sportif <laughs> oh goodness man. anyway can we in get back plural. to the program can we get back to the program with so max shandry the sports director of bmc racing uh, let's hear what his verdict was on yesterday's stage. It comes down to, you know, okay, rule is a rule. It needs to be applied. Uh, uh, then it went down. You know, I think I think the riders could have put a little bit more effort into to trying to, to, to stay closer to the time limit. I think they just really said, okay, let's stay together and we can finish in an hour and a half. They'll put us back in. They almost knew it. If it should have been applied or not, we had four riders in and, and four riders out because Hubert was already gone. He's gone home, so we have 50-50. I think uh, some teams had probably <laughs> they would have had one rider at the start today. So I just leave it, you know, with a no comment. Really, I mean, yes, you should have gone home. I mean, I think they should have gone home. Really, to tell you the truth. It would have made a real statement, wouldn't it? That, that look, the race is there, the rule is there. You've got to make an effort to get you know, to the line. Again, it goes down to these rules they have. You know, that's 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 a rule. What I accept, you know, there is a time that you need to finish. And a rule I don't accept is like, you know, a guy yesterday wanted to drink at eight k to go, and the commissaire says no. You know, so some things I agree, and some things I completely go against. We could talk about a lot of things I, I, I think are right and wrong, but they're all my point do you, of view. Do you think there's enough consultation between the people who make the rules and, and everyone, you know, no. the people who run the teams, Zero. the riders? Zero. They just make the rules and that's it. They should come inside uh, the teams and see how they run and, and understand things a little bit more and then, and then make the rules around it. Not to please people, but just to be more realistic with stuff. I mean, it would have been an amazing story for cycling. Talk about generating headlines. If they kicked out over half the race yesterday, I mean, you can't buy that kind of publicity, but it all got kind of massaged away and as if it didn't happen. It didn't happen. We did a... I wasn't there that year, but Tirreno Adriatico, and you could probably go and do a little research on the records. It started with probably 18 riders, two, two stages to go. The whole peloton got kicked out. So. I'd love to have seen today with 60 guys left, Chris Froome all on his own. At the end of the day, the helicopter is going to show the front guys. They're going to show the break, five guys, six guys, one guy, ten guys. So it'll still be 60 guys racing. Some, some team cars would have had one bike on the roof <laughs> or three of the same. <laughs> that would have been pretty, pretty strange to see. So, Daniel, perhaps more as a... Uh, uh, a desire to see a bit of mischief Max Chiandri would have liked to have seen all those riders eliminated from the race but the riders themselves obviously have a different point of view and I spoke to Kern de Court of Giant Alpacin after the finish today uh, 24 hours after the dust has settled to see what his point of view was Okay, I saw you tweet last night to say you'd never missed a time cut in a Grand Tour before um, but yesterday you were in the Gruppetto that was a long, long way behind the time cut. Can you describe what it was like in there? Was there much conversation going on? You obviously knew you had safety in numbers, very unlikely that they'd kick out so many riders. But what was it like in there? Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I'd never missed time cut altogether, not juniors, under-23 professionals in a single race. So uh, it was very unusual. 
And uh, yeah, as you said, we didn't just miss it. We uh, missed it by quite a quite a large margin. I guess it's a bit of the uh, how the Vuelta has been so far. It's been really, really hard. Yeah, and uh, after a seven-hour mountain stage, that was really, really tough. The next day, we've got a little three-kilometer, four-kilometer climb right from kilometer zero. And uh, just there, the best climbers in the world decide, uh, decide to attack each other. The bunch basically split with uh, two uh, groups of, uh, of great riders chasing each other. And uh, yeah, the group behind, we, just, we, uh, we uh, knew that we had no chance. We were not coming back because they were all racing full gas in the front. And uh, those were the best riders, so we weren't going to come back. At first, uh, Sky was, uh, was chasing. I, um, I thought that they were going to wait for us and then all ride together, but uh, yeah, that was not their tactic. And um, at one point, they set up, and yeah, it's basic, uh, basic math. We were not going to make it. We, we knew straight away. Like, we, we saw that the time, uh, the time cut, we knew that it was only going to be about half an hour. And uh, yeah, we we would lose in that group 15 minutes on the last climb, and yeah, by the time we would start riding and you know try, uh, keep pace, then we knew we were not going to make it. What we decided to do is all stick together, not um, safety in numbers. Trying to you know uh, knew that they weren't going to take us out. It was more you know just finally looking after each other and making sure we would all stay together. It's, we can all race full gas and you have a group that misses the time cut by five minutes and a group by 10 minutes and a group by 20 minutes. And um, yeah, I think uh, then uh, we write our own teammates uh, and our own uh, colleagues home uh, for the sole purpose of writing them home, not for making time cuts. We weren't going to make it anyway. I suppose that's one of the points that hasn't really been made is that if the front of the Gruppetto had pushed on and then maybe put 10 guys out the back, then those 10 guys would definitely have been eliminated maybe. And so you you were all looking for the collective of getting everybody home. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, uh, if we would have done that, um, who knows, uh, a few guys would have made time cut, but it means that two or three of my colleagues, my friends, would have to go home because I pushed them to. And, you know, uh, I think we're always racing and we're always competing and uh, we're trying to, to win races, but just uh, racing uh, for the sole purpose of eliminating uh, your, uh, your teammates, I, I, I think that was, uh, was a good decision of the group to stick together. And lastly on that, um, was there much conversation on the climb? Were you aware that it was quite an unusual circumstance and that the clock had ticked on so much? Yes, absolutely. It was basically straight away. We knew it. Uh, there um, was a bit of a talk, uh, a few guys that were trying to push the pace, and uh, which meant that some, uh, some uh, teammates from other riders were getting dropped. And uh, yeah, right then there was basically uh, an understanding between the group that we would r- basically ride the pace of the slowest rider. And, uh, and stick together in this one. Cone de Court there making the point that it was almost like a unionised decision to make sure that all the riders got home rather than pushing on at the front and perhaps eliminating a handful or 10 or 12. But the final word on this, well, other than Daniel, of course, who will come in a minute, but the final word on this from Javier Guillén, the race director of the Vuelta. Do you think that you would have generated a lot of publicity if the jury yesterday had, for example, eliminated all the riders that were out of the time limit. It would have been a huge story for cycling and everybody would be talking about how over half of the peloton didn't manage to make it in time. Well, it's a, a, good, question, a good question and for sure, uh, as organizer, I never want uh, to have the situation in the race, but now when you have to take the decision, you know, what's much better? A peloton with uh, 70 riders and no more teams in the in the peloton for the next year, and we have one week before us, or the best solution is to think in general uh, cycling and to say, okay, well, you are 91, 93 uh, guys uh, out, but if I don't rescue you, you know, your teams get not the publicity, you know, Vuelta is not a good platform for, for now, now one because you are uh, not here, you know, this is something difficult to manage because in one hand, when people say those guys should be eliminated okay, and today, all those people say, oh, I don't interest what you are offering me because all those guys are not here, so it's not easy to me, the best solution, never mind what happened to yesterday, because we lose everybody, everybody, not only organizer not only public, not only the city everybody, especially teams and, and ready. so I hope, and 
you know, it uh, never happened again. So Daniel, the race director, making it clear that he had no desire to see riders eliminated. I think you're certainly on that side of the fence as well. That, that it would have been extraordinary to have applied the rule rather than turn a blind eye, which is what happens 99.9% of the time. Yeah, it would have been. I mean, I'm going to actually read out the relevant UCI regulation line. It's regulation number 2.6.032, finishing deadline. The finishing deadline shall be set in the specific conditions or in the specific regulations for each race in accordance with the characteristics of the stage. In exceptional cases only, unpredictable and of force majeure, the commissaire's panel may extend the finishing time limit after consultation with the organiser. In case riders out of the time limit are given a second chance by the president of the commissaire's panel, they shall have confiscated the... This is terrible English, isn't it? It's they, have, they shall have confiscated the equivalent points awarded to the winner of the same stage to their individual... Well, we don't really care about this anyway, do we? The, the points and whatever penalty they might incur. But the, the words used there are exceptional cases, only unpredictable and a force majeure. So I took this this morning to the chief commissaire on the Vuelta, a, a French fellow called Hervé, no, Hervé Broch, or Broc. And um, I asked him, how can yesterday's circumstances be described as exceptional? And he said, well, it's, it's exceptional in the sense that the result w- would have been exceptional. 71 riders would have been left in the welter, and that is how they justified, justified it. That is how they rationalised it. However, he also said that at the end of this welter, he will submit a report in which he advocates a change to the rule, a change to the reg- regulation. So we'll watch that with great interest, won't we? But um, I also sp- spoke to a lot of riders this morning. Um, Bram Tanking's been a professional about 16, or is it 16, 17, 18 years, something like that. He said there have only really been two occasions when he feels it's been abused, and yesterday was one, or when the, the Gruppetto has finished miles outside the time limit. So he says it's not commonplace for um, the Gruppetto to really abuse it. Um... Joe Dombrowski, he was the, the odd one out for Cannondale yesterday. He was the only Cannondale rider who was outside the time limit. I staged a debate this morning between Moreno Moser and Joe Dombrowski because <laughs> Moser was inside the time limit and quite outspoken on Twitter, said that the rider should have been eliminated. And um, Dombrowski's very sensible su- suggestion was that the commissaires who are on the race, who are on motorbikes or in cars, and... Um, you know, are, are in the race for the duration of the stage, if they felt that the Gruppetta was really abusing the rule, um, there should have been probably some dialogue and they should have told the, the Gruppetta that they needed to hurry up. However, Dombrowski did admit they really didn't try very hard at all yesterday. Well, clearly not, because the average speed bears that out. Um, it, it was interesting talking to Javier Guillen and, and I made the point that it would have been a, an extraordinary story. The spotlight would have been on the Vuelta in perhaps not the most welcome way, but it would have been something that would have generated headlines and controversy and, and interest. Um, but, you know, is that justification to make an example of 71 riders? Probably not. On balance, I think you know they're in the race now. It was inevitable that somebody was going to do something in these remaining days um, to alter and influence the race it just so happens that today the stage winner and all of the other riders who are up there in the sprint were outside the time limit yesterday but i think draw a line under it really and and kind of move on yeah but you know let's suppose that the rule does get changed i mean what is the solution to this problem i I without having thought it through in in any great detail i would suggest that the solution is probably slightly generous more generous time limits particularly on these short stages, particularly if this is the way the cycling is going to go with shorter and shorter stages, and um, a rigorous enforcement and um, an invariable enforcement of the rule. Yeah, so there's no um, there's no, no, grow a- no grey areas, no discussion. If you're outside the time limit, you're outside. And I suppose that, that lends a certain amount of drama, doesn't it, particularly to the mountain stages. But I did kind of think, you know, think of all the times, all the hours, the days that the likes of Mark Cavendish and... Andre Greipel and Marcel Kittel and so on have, have really turned themselves inside out to, to make a time limit on the Tour de France, um, you know, fearing that they might be made an example of. But anyway, let's move, let's move that one on. Uh, Daniel, I think you've got a little update on one of the other 
slightly controversial talking points from yesterday, and that was Astana lending quite a hefty shoulder to Sky or Chris Froome's battle to try and limit his losses. Yeah, I mean, I sort of challenged Alexander Schaefer, the direct sportif, direct sportive line, or not sports director of Astana, uh, this morning in such a, such a weird thing to pick a to pick as a point. On, we don't call it a peloton, like you know. I, I mean, occasionally call it the bunch. Full of, it's full of <laughs> French. Vocabulary, isn't it? We're and in Spain. What's they come on place. Anyway, um, I challenged Schaefer about it this morning, about As- the amount of work that Astana had done in that second group with Froome yesterday. Um, and he, as you would probably expect, he put up a, quite a staunch defence of his team's tactics. He said that they'd missed the break and they hadn't come to the Welsh run holiday to be, you know, to sunbathe on the beach. They'd come to compete and if the team misses a break, they have to work. However, when when he gave me this answer, he was he was visibly trembling, <laughs> <laughs> which sort of undermined the credibility of it slightly. Were, were his eyes darting from left to right as he was speaking? Did it did it not have the uh, the, the ring of authenticity? His answer there, uh, possibly. I mean, I've, Schaefer is not someone that I've interviewed a lot, and um, he seems to me be quite nervous when he was <laughs> answering my question so I'm a, not sure. A slightly serious point though there Daniel is that it's not uncommon if a team misses a break or fouls up in some way it's not uncommon for a sports director or director sportif depending on which language we want to talk in to get on the radio and, and dish out a bit of punishment and say look guys you've missed a break you are now going to chase all day I mean this is it's been a sort of staple of some of the French teams at times hasn't it when, they, when they've made mistakes. Yeah and I think the culture at Astana is quite unique in in that regard um i was i had a long conversation a few days ago with the the press officer there jeffrey pizzorni who's an italian he said that it really is a different culture there in the sense that there is no there is no excuse at Aston. there is no sense of we we performed well the guys did a great ride and they finished second or they finished third and that should be applauded it is victory or, or nothing um, and, and that's certainly very different to um, a lot of teams, I think, in the in the World Tour. I think credit is given for things besides a victory. Um, but Astana, it, it, it's perhaps not the case. And perhaps yesterday, you know, they were almost being punished for having missed that break. Eurosport, the home of cycling. Thank you to Eurosport for their continued sponsorship of the Cycling Podcast. Um, enabling us to be out here at the Vuelta. Daniel, I drove the course today. I think you did too. I had a slightly uh, slightly eventful day, um, as ever. Uh, but it was a stunning route, wasn't it? I wasn't expecting the landscape that unfolded before me. It was really a quite attractive, you know, very you know, brown hues, but it was hot, summery. Big landscapes, weren't they, Lionel? Big landscapes, yeah. And, uh, and the climb in the middle of the stage up to the sort of very old town, absolutely glorious looking. Um, you know, I imagine looked very well on TV as well. It was almost a, an old school Vuelta stage, wasn't it? You, the, it was the kind of stage that we used to get a lot of in the 90s. Um, kind of big roads, very beautiful landscapes, but very arid, deserted landscapes. And, and yeah, not an awful lot happening on the stage, it has to be said. Um, I've also... I don't know where this could be long, Lionel, if I go into a tangent about the Osborne ball. Do you know what the Osborne ball is? Is this the, the, the logo iconic, we see yeah. all over? So it's yeah, not I been s- seen I saw on f- the... Well, I saw a, 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 a Citroen 2CV painted uh, yellow and red. The flanks were red, the middle was yellow, or was it the other way around? Anyway, like the Spanish flag, and it had the bull on the bonnet and on both doors and it was uh, by the side of the uh, road the osborne bull I, I mean i certainly remember from you know watching welters in the 90s you would see it on an almost daily basis and that really reflected the regions um where there are a lot of osborne bulls i'm not going to tell the whole story of the osborne bull um, i recommend that people look it up on wikipedia because it's quite fascinating um in short the, <laughs> the bull the, this iconic um, sort of advertising hoarding in the shape of a bull, which you see in various places in Spain. Um, it, it was conceived as an as a advertisement for brandy company, and um, you've got my year, you've got my attention. Yeah, and this <laughs> year we have not seen a single one. Line. I know this because I have an encyclopedic knowledge of where the Osborne bulls are 
in Spain, and we've not seen a single one on the whole route. These are the great big cut-out black balls, aren't they, that are sort of like advertising hoardings, but there's no wording on them at all, is no. there? They're just a, just a, a solid black, very muscular-looking ball. But you're right, yeah. But I did see them today in, well, as I say, on, on a Citroen 2 CV. badly wrong. I did, yeah. I went, went badly wrong today. Anyway, less of that. Um, we're in Castellon this evening, aren't we? Um, which is, um, yeah, it's not quite what I was hoping for. I've not been lucky so far. I feel like Richard got the, the better of the towns and the landscapes and I got the bit that I already know from the Tour de France and then, then the, lo- the long, long drives. But you know, I'm, not, I'm not bitter about it. But I'm enjoying my, my trip to the Vuelta. What have we got in store over the rest of the week, Daniel? Well, we've got a tough summit finish um, on Wednesday. Um, so I say summit finish. It's a typical Vuelta summit finish. Um, I'm just, I'm just, I just forget exactly the name of where we're finishing, but it's a three and a half kilometre, extremely steep ramp. Um, I don't know if some listeners might remember or might be familiar with the Zoret de Cati climb near Alicante. This is a, a very similar climb. Um, so we've got that on Wednesday, and then we've got a fairly uneventful stage coming on. Thursday, then we've got the time trial, which of course everyone has been talking about and, and debating and, and wondering whether Chris Froome can take back enough time on Nairo Quintana on Friday. Well, um, just on that, before we move on to Saturday, um, the, the story brewing is of the fires down in that region um, near Javier. As I drove down the motorway this evening, the, the billboards above the electronic kind of signs above the motorway were warning of extreme fire hazards it's it's very very warm isn't it and uh you do get the sense that you know just a stray cigarette butt might create a a real uh well everyone smokes over here i mean i've checked into my hotel room and and spoken like a wannabe arsonist (laughs) (laughs) oh dear no (laughs) not to tempt fate but if one were to (laughs) If one, if one were to uh, desire an enormous blaze, now I mean, shouldn't we shouldn't make light of this because it's a it's a serious problem in the quite close proximity to the um, to the time trial course on Friday, and at this stage, we don't yet know whether that's going to have any impact or not. There's still a few days to go, so presumably there's plenty of time to. Uh, get that situation under control. Don't know what's happened in the last few hours, even on on that one. But um, certainly something that is on the radar of the welter organisers this evening. And then Saturday is the the final uphill finish, the final chance for any jiggery pokery on GC, isn't it? Yeah, you look at the general classification. So you got Froome uh, three minutes thirty seven behind Quintana. Uh, you have got Chavez three minutes fifty seven, and Contador four minutes two seconds. Yates, five minutes, seven seconds. I mean, who can make serious ground that day on the time trial day? I think Talansky could end. He, he could find himself in the top five in the Vuelta because he is currently 6.43 down on Nairo Quintana. Um, and Simon Yates is 5.07 down. I think Simon Yates could well be in Talansky's sight if, of course, Talansky doesn't shed any more time on that mountaintop finish. And we've got the Aitana on on Saturday, which itself is a very difficult finish. Talansky has been riding in the tradition of Heimar Zabeldia, hasn't he? A very, uh, almost the invisible GC rider of that uh, group, really. I've seen Zubeldia. I've, he's been spotted several times in this Vuelta, both before, during and after stages. Well, I should have brought my uh, my Ala Zabeldia T-shirt with me, but uh, but I didn't pack that one. Uh, if you want an Ala Zabeldia T-shirt, I think they're still available on the the, the cyclingpodcast dot com. Go to the shop section. Uh, they may not be available actually. I'm I know there's a new range of T-shirts, isn't there? There's a, there's a, a special Vuelta Pedaler de Charme, um, which is yellow and red wording on a on a black T-shirt. Looks very smart. Um, anything else, Daniel? Before we go and have some tapas, I've, I've been you asked me what my impressions of Spain were. It's not, it's not been quite what I expected, but I had anticipated some really good eating, and unfortunately it's not worked out that way due to circumstances. not your fault, obviously. Not, but not Spain's fault either. No, we, well, we were in France for you know, a day and a half, really, weren't we? Um, so we got what, what we expected there. Um, but we should, we should probably stroll into the old town here, if there is one, and find somewhere pleasant to eat. Indeed. Uh, rest day tomorrow, so we'll be back on Wednesday. In the meantime, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, Lionel.
Hablamos de 